podcasting, The Latest Frontier. These are the episodes of a Catch as Catch Can podcast. It's continuing mission to explore strange, nerdy topics, to chat about sports, movies, sci-fi, and so much more, to boldly pod where this nerd has gone before. Captain's Log, pod date, 0901.19. On this episode of Too Boldly Pod, we're going to discuss, continue to discuss Doctor Who and my little synopsis review look back at the seventh Doctor portrayed by Sylvester McCoy. We're also going to delve into unidentified flying objects, the mythos of UFOs, if you will. And we're going to discuss, preview the NFL season, which is about to kick off, and give you my Loctite, rolled gold, 100% wrong Super Bowl prediction. We also have a fun little To Boldly Pod question, and we're going to take a look at what's in the news. So, Scotty, set phasers on stun, engage. If you're a regular listener to this podcast, you know that of late I have sort of been re-rewatching the entire run of Doctor Who. And when I finish a Doctor, I come on here and I sort of chat about it. Now, last week I talked about my finishing off of the six Doctor episodes featuring Colin Baker, to which I must come on here before we can continue or before we move on and say was pointed out to me that I misspoke the name of the fifth doctor. I called him John Davison, which, of course, we all know is the current lead singer of the band Yes, which is an understandable reason why I would make such a mistake, but his name is actually Peter Davison, so apologies to Mr. Davison for that. And I talked about the... Six Doctor then, and I finished up, and I actually finished watching the six one a few weeks ago and just got around to talking about it. I have also finished the seventh Doctor episodes, which happens to be the last Doctor before the BBC finally pulled the plug on the program for its initial run. So the seventh Doctor was portrayed by Sylvester McCoy and I talked last week about how Colin Baker didn't want to come back to film the regeneration scene so Sylvester McCoy dressed up in Colin Baker's clothes and that's how they filmed this regeneration now there are two things about the seventh doctor that a, I really liked, and B, I didn't like. B, the thing I didn't like, and I think what sort of put the nail in the the coffin, so to speak, of the first run of the series was they started off with some very 80s-themed looking, I should say, 80, very 80s-looking episodes try to modernize it a little bit in the 1980s, and I just don't think that appealed to too many fans of Doctor Who. They, they, and they, they stayed, although they did travel to other planets, there wasn't a lot of sort of the space themes. They were more, they were on planets, but it was, they might as well have just been on Earth. And the other thing initially is they tried to sort of modernize the storytelling to make it more of a modern 
type of storytelling, kind of putting a little more drama and modern day issues into the stories. So that first season had the seventh doctor and my favorite companion of all time, (laughs) Mel. And then near the end of that first season with the seventh doctor, we got introduced to Ace, which was going to replace Mel. Thank the maker. (laughs) And there was sort of a, a paradigm shift and well, actually, before we get to that, what the, the the way that they were portraying the seventh Doctor was more along the lines of the second Doctor at the very beginning. He was sort of a bumbling buffoon, misspeaking phrases and whatnot, kind of making him whether it was intended that way or that's how his personality came off. As they tried to make him the the bumbling buffoon slash genius and. Near the end of that first season, they sort of took a little turn, and it's when Mel left, thank the maker, and they brought in Ace. She was a a young companion, sort of the prototypical companion moving forward from that point once the series rekindled in 2005, but we'll talk about that as we move along. And Ace brought in the youth, and the athleticism, and Sylvester McCoy became more of the evil genius, minus, you know, he wasn't really evil, but he really played people to get things to happen. And the second and third season of The Seventh Doctor, one of the things that really stood out is they took more of a macabre way of storytelling. A lot of gothic type themes in his second and third season and I thought personally that was something refreshing something new something the way they were they were trying to to keep it going now the one downfall I will say that may have possibly been the reason that it ended up getting the show killed off was Within their storytelling, they were putting so many layers within the story. It was kind of hard, especially back then when you really only watched it once and maybe got to see it again on a rerun. It wasn't like now where you can watch it over and over and pick things up. But there were so many things included in those stories and it wasn't hard to miss stuff and sort of kind of get lost so in that aspect I understand given the time why it wasn't successful but I liked how they went to more of a gothic storytelling format a lot of ghosts and creatures and mythological things and whatnot and they still had their final say with the Daleks and the Cybermen so all in all the Seventh Doctor is actually, of the 80s Doctors, probably my favorite of the 80s ones. He's he's upper middle of the pack if I was to rank my Doctors, but <sighs> if he didn't have Mel that first season, <laughs> I digress. But anyways, what happened with the show was all the actors were still signed on for a fourth season, and they actually had some stories in pre-production to start a fourth season for The Seventh Doctor, and that is when the BBC ultimately decided to pull the plug on it. And he didn't come back again until that ill-fated 2005, excuse me, 1996 TV movie American TV movie filmed in Canada, actually. But we'll talk about that next time as we kick off, because we're going to skip the Eighth Doctor and the TV movie and just move right to 2005 and the rebirth with the Ninth Doctor. If you have any thoughts about Sylvester McCoy or the Seventh Doctor, let me know on Facebook or Twitter at Too Boldly Pod. 
Now, just about every week here on this podcast, I like to pose questions to my friends on social media, sort of a fun way to incorporate everybody to be part of this podcast. And generally, they come from things that happen or I think about during my workday. Now, this week I was in my work van and the song Journey any way you want it came on the radio and subconsciously I just started air drumming along. So that made me think this week's to boldly pod question, name a song when it comes on, you immediately start jamming to it was kind of a last minute question. So thank you to everybody that answered a lot of great, great replies. So Marianne replied, Kickstart My Heart or any Motley Crue song. Jenny replied, pretty much all of yes. Oh, swoon. <laughs> Noted author Paul Canellis replied, Thin Lizzy, the boys are back in town, almost always gets the air guitar treatment. Jim replied, Jefferson Starship Jane, the cult sea she sells seashells by the seashore sorry the cult she sells sanctuary and david bowie rebel rebel kate replied rush tom sawyer and def leppard photograph jody replied don't stop me now by queen kelly replied 25 or 6 to 4 everyone has to shut up when that song comes on lol Narek replied, as Lip said once on a 13-hour road trip, is there any song you don't know the words to? So I guess Narek jams to everything. Andy replied, beat the system. Jeremiah replied, the safety dance gives me a lead foot, ironically. Don't you think? And Carol replied, carry on, my wayward son which that's a great choice because a couple years ago I actually got to see Kansas in concert and they were pretty damn good. So thank you to everybody that answered this week's To Boldly Pod. And if you have a song that when it comes on, you immediately start jamming out to, air guitaring to, air drumming to, let me know on Facebook or Twitter at To Boldly Pod. Now, last week, we talked about the preview of the college football season, and this week is the final week of the dreaded NFL preseason, or most players will say the waste of time preseason NFL season. But that means next week, the NFL kicks off in full force. And I, it's one of the hardest things to do is to make a, a Super Bowl prediction and sort of preview the NFL season because as rough of a sport as football is, it's, it's kind of hard to disseminate, to, to prophesize who's going to come out of the season unscathed and be the champion. And I think I said this a year ago on this very podcast that Everybody just keeps saying that was the end of the New England Patriots the previous year, but yet at the end of the season, they're still there or darn near there. So, I mean, what can you do? They lost Gronk, but yet Tom Brady is still there. It seems like during this whole going on an almost 20-year run now, they there's two constants Tom Brady and Bill Belichick every all the other pieces have changed other than you know the owner Robert Kraft but it's like when are we going to stop betting against the Patriots I mean there's really only one undefeated thing in this entire world that we live in and that's time Time always wins. But it's almost like Belichick and Brady just look at time and laugh. So who knows? But what's up with this year in NFL? In the NFL? I mean, 
who knows? I mean, I'm going to make a prediction, but as those of you that have listened to these previous podcasts will know, I have never even remotely come close to getting one. Actually, I think I did a few years ago. I came really close to getting a Super Bowl prediction, but I think it was one team got in and one team made the championship game or something. I don't, I can't recall. But one thing that we have learned this past week, as a matter of fact, is the uncertainty of the NFL game with Andrew Luck unexpectedly calling it quits for the Indianapolis Colts. And you can have your opinion on that or not, whether the timing was bad or whatnot. But, I mean, it's his life, so he can do what he wants with it and... Kudos to him for the career that he did have. And I can appreciate him walking away and not wanting to go through the rigors of what it probably is because I really have no idea. I'm not a an elite athlete or an athlete in general. but So I wouldn't know what it takes to keep her body at that point. So... Kudos to you. So who do I think is going to be the teams to watch this year? And I'm not entirely sure that I think Kansas City is going to repeat what they did last year or take another step last, like they did last year. I think maybe they'll come back down to earth, but I could totally be wrong. I don't think the Rams will be what they were last year, but I could totally be wrong. So, here we go. Well, first of all, if you have a prediction, let me know on Facebook or Twitter at Too Boldly Pod, and we'll mark all of these down and have a little fun revisiting them at the end of the season. So, before I get to it, what do I think my Lions will do? I think they have improved with their personnel. I think this is the year that Matt Patricia needs to show something as a coach. And most pundits are calling them a 6-8 to eight win football team. And I think actually if this new offense works the way it's supposed to, I think their defense is good enough that they could be a dare I say, 9-10 to 10 win football team. Just barely eking into the playoffs, maybe? I don't know. Maybe it's just the Lion fan in we, me continuously hoping for a playoff win for the second time in 60 years. <laughs> Anyways, my Super Bowl prediction, It's like I said, it's hard to go away from New England But I've sort of bought into the Cleveland hype this year. That would be sort of the most hyped up NFL team thing that could possibly happen. Have a team that just a few years ago was 0-16 and and just a handful of years later make the Super Bowl. But I don't think they're going to do it. I think they're going to make the playoffs. I think they're going to be a, a rising team. I just don't think they're going to go all the way. So, that being said, in the AFC, I don't want to pick San Diego because they've already lost some key players before the season has even started. And I know a lot of people are Phillip Rivers fans, but I'm just not one of them. He never seems to get it done when he needs to get it done. Kind of sounds like Matt Stafford. I digress. (laughs) So... It's really hard to pick a team. I mean, I think Kansas City is going to take a step back. But New England? I don't know. You know what? I'm just in the AFC. I'm going to go with Kansas City. I'm going to go with a safe choice. Kansas City, my sleeper, will be the Cleveland Browns. Now, in the NFC side, that's even a bigger ball of wax because, as I stated earlier, I don't think the Rams are going to be as good as they were last year. And 
I don't. Chicago had a good team last year and the double doink thing and blah, blah, blah. I just don't think Mitchell Trubisky is that great of a quarterback. I think they take a step back as well. So in the NFC, it's really a flip of a coin this year. I don't think there's one standout team. I don't think anybody in the West is going to do it. As I said, I thought the Rams were going to take a step back. Eventually, much like Tom Brady, Father Time has got to catch up to Drew Brees. So I don't think New England, New England, New Orleans is going to be as good as they were last year. Nobody in my central division, I believe, has any chance of making the Super Bowl. So that leads us to the East. And the Giants are a dumpster fire. Washington is a dumpster fire. Dallas is decent, but I just don't think they have it. So, by proxy, that leads me to say the Philadelphia Eagles will be the Super Bowl representative for the NFC. Now, Kansas City versus Philadelphia. Who do I think is going to (sighs) win? Let's go Kansas City Chiefs. And don't I sound like I'm talking out of the side of my, my mouth because... When we started this segment, I said I didn't think Kansas City was going to be as good as they were last year. And that's the the beauty of the NFL. You just don't know. So, me, Kansas City, and Philadelphia, Kansas City will be your Super Bowl champions. But as my history of predictions have gone, you can take that to the bank that it will not happen. We've talked about UFOs a few times on this podcast, and I've shared the experience that I had in the 80s, and we had my buddy Rob on, and he talked about the experience he had in his youth as well, but UFOs or unidentified flying objects or flying saucers is one of the most divisive topics in the paranormal i mean the it, it it's common knowledge that there's been polls done where over 50% of americans believe in the existence of ufo's or extraterrestrials so i don't necessarily want to have that debate over whether people believe in ufo's or not i wanted to do this segment More on the mythos of UFO or ufology. And it's because, well, one, it's thundering outside right now. And what a cool background to a mysterious topic. (laughs) Seriously. The reason I want to do it is most people think it's a modern day thing that started in the 20th century when actually there's a, a deep, long history of unidentified flying objects. Now, I'm not going to sit here and lecture about all of the historical UFO sightings. That would be probably boring for the listener and take away from your opportunity to sit down in front of the Discovery Channel or History Channel and watch all those great shows. But there are a few that sort of stand out to me as somebody who believes in UFO, somebody who thinks it's plausible that we are being visited on occasions. And I just want to point them out to them. And a couple of them really are interesting. And I'll start with the probably the most famous of the ancient world ones. And that, of course, is the famous painting Madonna with Sam Giovanni from the 15th century. Now, I'll just start off by saying that there's a lot of debate to this day over who the true artist of that painting is, but the painting itself has been correctly dated from the 15th century. And if you're not aware what it is, just search Google Madonna with San Giovanni, and you will see a Madonna, a lady, with what appears to be some sort of glowing flying object 
in the air behind her. And it's just interesting to think in the 1400s, they were still hundreds of years from even dirigibles or hot air balloons. So where would they come up with that concept that was very interesting? Now, I know the skeptic side of the argument over that painting would say that the artist was drawing a comet or a falling star or something. And I suppose that could be true. I mean, we'll never know since we can't talk to the author. But if you actually look at it and blow it up, it really does look like a mechanical object that they are portraying in the air. Now, just a couple other ones from ancient times, and one is from 1561 when residents of Nuremberg described the appearance of a large black triangular object, and according to witnesses, there were also hundreds of spheres, cylinders, and other odd-shaped objects that moved erratically overhead. Now, again, 1561, still hundreds of years away from anything man-made that would fly in the air. Now, the next one is where you can really kind of tip your hat to a skeptic because we're into the aviation age, and it's from 1878, where the Denison Daily News printed an article in which John Martin, a local farmer, had reported seeing a large, dark, circular object resembling a balloon flying, quote, at wonderful speed. Martin, according to the newspaper account, said it appeared to be about the size of a saucer, which happened to be one of the very first times the word saucer was associated with a UFO. Now, as I stated, that can be easily explained since the witness himself used the phrase balloon and hot air balloons were in existence in 1878. Now, with aeronautical starting and planes taking off in the 20th century, most people consider the UFO phenomenon to start World War II era, late 1940s, really exploding in 1947 with the Kenneth Arnold sighting, which spawned the name Flying Saucers, and of course with the Roswell incident. But in fact, in World War II, there were many pilots that had reported seeing unidentified objects during their dogfights, and they coined a phrase, Foo Fighters. Now, you might just think that's a, a band, but they actually got their name from explanation of UFOs by... World War II pilots calling them, as I said, Foo Fighters. But there were reports of flying objects by pilots even before World War II. I mean, as far back as 1904, 1916, 1916, 1926, and in the 1916 account, a UK pilot in Rochford reported a row of lights resembling lighted windows on a railroad car- and a railway carriage that rose and disappeared. The 26 report was a pilot reported six flying manhole covers between Wichita, Kansas and Colorado Springs, Kansas. And in late 1926, an airmail pilot over Nevada said to have been forced to land by a huge wingless cylindrical object. Now, my whole point to sort of this UFO history lesson is to point out that it's not just a modern thing. So a lot of these skeptics will go and say it's just imagination, drug-induced, paranoia, Cold War, this, that, or the other, when in fact this has been going on for almost our entire history. So am I saying with with 100% alacrity 
that UFOs are real. I mean, to myself, yes, I am. But can I 100% concretely prove it? No, I can't. But you know what? The flip side of that, a skeptic can't possibly say that we are alone in this vast, vast universe. If you have a UFO experience or you just like to come on here and talk about UFOs, let me know on Facebook or Twitter at Too Boldly Pod, and I will gladly revisit this topic yet again. And in the news today, this comes from MSN.com's offbeat section, and the headline is, A Brooklyn Airbnb is going viral after it turned out to essentially be a tiny Harry Potter-esque cupboard under the stairs. Rentals can be a luxurious getaway or a seaside escape, but some listings on the site can be just the opposite, if they even exist. Zoe Reeve arrived at her Brooklyn, New York Airbnb room in a shared apartment to find that it was just a small, cramped closet space that appeared to be under a staircase. It's literally a little cupboard with a mattress on the floor, Reeve said in a now deleted video that went viral on Twitter, but Reeve, who was visiting New York from England for the Labor Day Carnival Parade, told insiders that she knew she was getting into when she booked the room on Airbnb just a few weeks ago for only $27 a night. So, that being said, A, you getting some for 27 bucks a night, shouldn't you know something's up? B, why not stay in a cupboard? It's got a mattress. And C, what the hell is wrong with mankind? And that's going to wrap up this episode of Too Boldly Pod. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any thoughts about anything that we talked about, let me know on Facebook or Twitter at Too Boldly Pod. And coming up, In future episodes, we're going to discuss my fantasy football team, which we have the draft in a few days. Probably take Andrew Luck, I don't know. And we're also going to continue to investigate our Tuboodly Pod Halloween special coming up at the end of October by continuing to talk about the things of a paranormal nature. Also, next week, we're going to have a little music topic about something that my buddy Rob turned me on to, and it's a very intriguing little story. So stay tuned for that next week. And as usual, in the music sense, I don't have a closer to this show, so I'll just quote Casey Kasem, keep your feet in the ground, and keep reaching for the stars. WLLP, Spock Rock Radio.